So my name is Chero Neville. I'm the curator of the Kamloops Art Gallery, and I am honored to be standing here with Melanie O'Brien, who's the curator of the Morris and Helen Belkin Art Gallery, and Caitlin Jones, who's an independent curator. Both have come from Vancouver and have been hustling with us the last few days as well. Um, Melanie had started thinking about this exhibition, as Margaret said, years and years ago, talking with Naomi Potter, uh, who's the director of the Esker Foundation uh, in Calgary, Alberta. And the conversation started with them, however long ago that was, and then Melanie started talking to me about the ideas in this exhibition around 2019. So this is how long it's been percolating. And then we brought the brilliant Caitlin uh, Jones in uh, for her expertise around thinking through property and um, housing rights. And uh, you'll get a sense of her great mind as we uh, go through. Uh, it, it's taken the three of us to kind of parse these ideas. Um, and they're big and they're not um, t in, in, we're not trying to say everything, but we kind of are, I think. Um, but uh, the, the exhibition is 10 artists. There's one expansive collective, all based in BC. Um, and um, we are also, uh, so we're the first stop and the next exhibition will be at the Morris and Helen Belkin Art Gallery in January 2025. It will look mostly like this, but it may be something a little bit different too. Um, so it's a partnership between institutions, between contexts, focused on this uh, false binary but enduring binary of the town and country, city and country, urban, rural. Um, and uh, so we're kind of poking at those ideas in our thesis. And um, the other aspect of it, too, is that um, British Columbia is unceded territory. Um, our institutions are um, on unceded territory. And um, so we're very aware of that. And we're also aware of the fact that there are different conceptions of land and territory that go beyond um, town and country uh, as well. And I hope that you really get a sense of that as we go through. Um, and and I think from Dina and Greg's welcome, we, we know what we're talking about. Um, so uh, in terms of this kind of curatorial premise, um, we're interested in thinking about um, the idea, the romanticized idea of the country as this place of health and retreat, um, but uh, obscuring these romantic ideas, kind of obscuring um, the conditions of colonialism, capitalism, labor. Uh, so uh, when I think about this context in particular, um, with Kamloops being kind of a small city um, built on indigenous land where claims were uh, staked, and the railway runs through kind of like a through line between Kamloops and Vancouver, um, this notion of progress by any means necessary, um, bringing goods back and forth between uh, the city and, and the building of, of British Columbia based on that, on that concept, and now with the, the pipeline. So there's this, this uh, through line that I'm thinking about there. I'm also um, thinking in particular with Kamloops about the new cultural strategic plan that we have in place. and. Um, this community effort to um, contextualize what we might think of as a livable city. So these kind of things are at the heart of um, this context for me. Um, and uh, I'm going to pass it to Melanie now to talk about kind of three cycles of exodus that we're grounding the exhibition in. Thanks, Tara. <clears throat> 
So as, yeah, just to follow on what Chara was saying, I mean, this idea of the exodus from the city to the country by artists and by others for a kind of um, respite from industrialization or respite from the kind of ills of the city is something that has been a cycle that has been ongoing. So within this exhibition, we definitely ground ourselves in the industrial revolution and the arts and crafts movement, the socialism of um, the William Morris kind of moment. Um, we also think about the 1960s back to the land movement and um, then we are also thinking very much about what has happened around the pandemic and the kind of retreat to the rural because people can now work um, anywhere and what we're kind of calling a cottage core uh, moment. Um, so I expect that um, within those cycles, you'll know of other cycles, but in the thinking about this exhibition that Taro mentioned from the beginning, watching the cycles of artists leave Vancouver in particular or Calgary because it becomes unaffordable, um, but knowing that those um, cycles of housing, those cycles of, ac of um, accommodation, of capital accumulation rely on private property and rely on a particular way that we understand land and so that is sort of the um, on top of a indigenous conception of land um, so I think that this is sort of where we're grounding the slipperiness between there is no distinction necessarily between account and country they're a doppelganger of one another they're economically politically socially tied to the colonial and capitalist forces um, so I think I'll leave it there um, and shall we start with Tanya Willard who I know is here Tanya would you be willing to speak to your work first <laughs> right white uh, request Tanya Willard's if you look at the banner behind you I just uh, I just phrased how we refer to our land and language and governance uh, so so doesn't only refer to our territory which is here in Kamloops and actually is a large area uh, some people translate so to the spread out people um, so our territory is quite large and a lot of my work is looking at how to activate land in the context of the colonial condition. So I live on Nesconleth uh, Indian Reserve, and the Indian Reserve is maybe the uh, outside of the binary of town and country, but is a, a very prone place, uh, still very much today affected by ongoing colonialism and capitalism. And in my work, I try to address this and continue my ancestors' work to assert our rights to our territory. Uh, in my case, I do it through my art making and, and supporting Sokwatmuk language and indigenous resurgence in my community. So this work behind you, obviously, you'll recognize it as uh, adjacent to the Kamloops, uh, City of Kamloops logo. Uh, this work is from quite a few years ago, I think 2009. I had a solo exhibition here. Uh, thank you again to the curators and to the staff here at Kamloops Art Gallery. I've done uh, a lot with the Kamloops Art Gallery over, over years. And uh, this was an important work for me as I transitioned from living in the city to moving back home uh, in order to be closer to a context of language and culture for my children. So uh, my work is activated through land. And so uh, it's really through collaboration with humans and non-humans, other artists, including Gabriel Hill, whose work here is behind me, is a member and activator, and here, a member and activator of Bush Gallery, which is a way I refer to uh, the ways that I'm addressing colonialism and my ongoing presence and relationship with the land uh, by also thinking about spaces outside of the gallery. Love the gallery, love our chances to be here together and to thank uh, with artists and be in these spaces. But also for me, I, I, it's important for me to also get outside of the gallery, be on the land and examine that relationship back and forth. The other work in the hallway is a series of banners uh, that reference different resurgent and present continuum uh, cultural activities on the land. Uh, and I shot them with a um, red filter uh, to think about contrast in black and white photography and historical photography in British Columbia and that uh, project, colonial project building. Uh, and then 
the second set of banners actually then didn't require a red filter because of our red skies uh, with the fires. And so I'm thinking always about how the land is changing and how we can come together uh, to address that and to be in better relation with the land. So Cook's Jam, thank you. Um, I'm gonna, the next artist we'd like to speak is Carol Moisevich. Are you ready for this? I'm Carol, Carol Moisevich. And um, when I first started trying to be a serious artist, when my children were getting bigger, I um, tried to find a way to make my art very, very transient and not available to be collected or owned as a trophy or an investment. Not that I had a lot of trouble with that, but you know. It was, I, I worked in a lot of different ways and did, even did things like posters. It was always at the bottom of the birdcage, eventually, or in, you know, wrapping up something. And then I uh, drew on gallery walls and so on and so forth, and then got tired of it all and went to Lytton with my part partner, Gordon, and we bought a, a little shambly house, did it all up did the garden. I was kind of painting, and I didn't really find my feet. And then, one day, three years ago, fate played a real joke on me, trying to make my art transient. It burned the whole fucking lot down. In a fire. The whole village went. We lost everything. So then, we came back to Vancouver, and I had to think of how to start again and how I thought about property, my knickknacks, my clothes, whatever it was. And I felt at first as if I had no identity whatsoever because I was my killums or whatever. But anyway, then I just started painting the fire. So. This is what my first three paintings look like. I did some drawings, but... And they've even got frames on, so they're kind of permanent. But whatever. <laughs> so that's... It's, and these are about our place in the cosmos. And that fire was nothing compared with what goes on out there. And so I tried to sort of position myself in that place of being a tiny piece of dust in the universe and think about land, property, jewelry, or whatever it was as totally, I mean, it's so tiny. So it's not as, it's not as political, really, but it is eventually. And now it's Holly. Where's Holly? There she is. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's so great to see so many familiar faces and just everyone here tonight. Uh, it's such an honor to be showing again at the Kamloops Art Gallery. I love this place. I think it's a really important uh, institution. I appreciate everything you guys do. Um, yeah, I think Melanie and I were in conversation uh, about some of these ideas maybe a decade ago maybe. Um, just a little bit uh, about me and the piece, uh, my piece, which is here. Um, so I spend part of the year about 45 minutes north uh, of here um, uh, in Sequapmakulu uh, in an artist kind of project, Art as Life um, uh, built environment that has been uh, part of an act of arts patronage and, and generosity. Um, this piece uh, was originally made in uh, 2016, and it was actually uh, a commission piece that Caitlin commissioned for uh, a conference uh, through the Western Front called Urgent Imagination. And Urgent Imagination was sort of uh, invited artists from uh, different places all over the globe to come to Vancouver and make projects kind of thinking about uh, the unaffordability of cities across the globe, and in particular, uh, the forces of gentrification uh, and and like the rampant real estate speculation in Vancouver and in um, the East Vancouver uh, Mount Pleasant neighborhood. 
So at that time, I had been kind of spending my time between uh, Hefley Creek, uh, Vancouver, and uh, Berlin. And um, I, we came back from Berlin in 2016 and tried to live in Vancouver again, and we realized we were priced out. We were officially not able to afford the city that we kind of considered our home. So this piece was actually kind of a, an homage to being priced out of our community. This um, banner image that you see here is a drawing that was made in um, 1525 by the uh, uh, Dutch artist Albrecht Durer. You might know some of his works. He's a very famous illustrator and artist. Uh, and this piece was called, the drawing was called uh, Monument to a Vanquished Peasant. So um, the piece was to commemorate the peasant uprisings of Europe uh, of the 16th century. And he made this drawing with a list of instructions which are available here on a poster. And the poster is a free takeaway, so you can take copies of this poster. Uh, and it's a set of instructions. If someone wishes to erect a victory monument to commemorate the vanquishing of peasants, one would construct it as such. And then he uh, describes all the layers of the, the accoutrements of the peasant's life uh, to be stacked with very like specific dimensions, etc. So you can see there's like a, a, like a butter churn, um, uh, an urn, uh, there's like a stack of hay and some implements, uh, a chicken coop, and then the peasant himself sitting on top of the stack with a sword in his back. So um, this, this work was, um, uh, when I made it in 2016 for Urgent Imagination, this was uh, positioned outside on a vacant lot on East Broadway, uh, and it was brought back into this exhibition in a bit of a different form to be in conversation with these ideas. So um, yeah, help yourself to the poster, read the instructions. You could then go and make your own uh, sculptural monument if you wish. I think I'll leave it right there. Thank you. Gabrielle Hill is not here with us today, so I'm just gonna speak about her work. Here we go. Um, these three pieces that are here are three of four small sculptures that are called Four Effigies to the End of Property. Um, Gabe is a sculptor um, who uses a lot of found materials and likes to think about this idea of the effigy, and that is a sculpture that kind of contains within it or represents an idea or a set of ideas. And in this instance, these three effigies here are sort of exploring three ways in which um, real estate, law, and colonial property have um, stolen land from indigenous people. So there's three different ones here. This one in the corner is called highest and best use. So highest and best use is a sort of a zoning and taxation term that's used to ascribe value to a property. And it's not about property as it is, as a space for growing food, as a space for having a home, as a space for doing nothing. It's about what is the most value, financial value that can be extracted from that lot. So oftentimes, uh, highest and best use is used as a taxation mechanism so that you're paying taxes on the future development potential of your property not what your property just can simply exist and do. Um, this sculpture here, I should mention that all of these, these works were all commissioned um, for the opening of the Polygon Gallery, which is an art gallery in North Vancouver. And all the objects from, that make up these sculptures are deaccessioned objects from um, the North Vancouver Archive, Museum and Archive. And so this one is called Preempt. So all of this material was kind of pulled from the area around where um, the Polygon Gallery is, which is, if you know Vancouver, it's kind of right near where the sea bus comes in, the Lonsdale Key area. So Preempt is this one, is another real estate mechanism in which settlers were able to stake a claim on land, 
on what we would call crown land, which we understand to be unceded indigenous territory. Um, so this is playing with the idea of um, the preemption. This third sculpture is called Be Long. And this is more of a, like I said, Gabe thinks about her sculptures as vessels for ideas. And for her, the idea of capital accumulation, property ownership, highest and best use, these are just ideas that we have. And they're ideas that are dominant, but they can be changed. And they are not permanent. They're just ideas that we've sort of held onto. So this, uh, I, this belong is sort of an imagining of different ways of thinking about communal property ownership, about indigenous uh, being on the land, that they, we actually have options. We can think another way if we want to. Um, so with that, I think we're gonna move into the other room. Janet Wang is gonna speak about her work. Oh yeah, of course. Thank you, everyone. This is my first time seeing this work so large, so I might keep looking over my shoulder, too. Um, I'm really happy to speak about this work. It, it really began, um, and I, I was really moved by hearing all the other artists speak and the curators speak about how this exhibition came together, because I see a lot of the threads that tie all of these things together. This idea of this space-time continuum that was spoke, uh, talked about, the cycles, um, when I look at this work and when I think about where this work began, it really began when I was a socially awkward teen in the 90s, growing up in Richmond, BC, where we were experiencing a, a really big change to that uh, community, where we had a huge wave of immigration coming from Hong Kong due to the handover. And experiencing that first wave, or that particular wave of immigration, uh, really started to make me very aware and uncomfortable with my own racialized identity and starting to be very aware of what it meant to be Chinese in Canada. And so this is a question that has continued to be part of my practice as now a socially awkward artist adult <laughs> and really trying to still think through these questions about my identity and how that plays out in a larger way for the diasporic communities and for the many different layers of immigration of uh, Chinese uh, diaspora. And so this work here um, first started off as a large billboard piece, which was pitched to uh, a gallery in Hamilton, in Hamilton, but somehow ended up being part of a national billboard exchange, so it ended up in Saskatoon over a Chinese restaurant, they told me. So that was perfect, they said. So it was there, but then during the pandemic, I decided to take this big billboard piece, which is a big panoramic piece, and then animate it and bring it to life. And so this was uh, a work of love created with animators who I still have not actually met face to face because we did this all remotely. So thinking about this idea of remote connections as well too. And you'll see that there's many different things happening at once from different time periods. So it's really punching through the space-time continu continuum. So we'll see things that are speaking to my artistic practice, things that are speaking to the nature of cities today, and also these layers of history of the first waves of Chinese immigration due to uh, needs of labor, due to imperialist forces, due to the, the use of, of Chinese uh, bodies as cheap, expendable labor to build a lot of the infrastructure around BC. And so that also leads me to this work over here, um, which is created on and printed on Tyvek. Um, this was created after uh, I pitched to the Canada Council to do a mobile residency during the pandemic because all the residencies and travel I had planned um, went out the window. So I took my entire family, I thought this was a great idea, on a three-week camping trip along the BC Gold Rush Trail. And this was in 2021, so this was during the heat dome. And we left in June, we got to Lytton, uh, went to the beautiful Chinese uh, Heritage Museum there, and then two days later learned that the entire village and community had been destroyed. And so we were chased by wildfires the whole way 
along this route. And we came through Kamloops, of course, to look also at the railway routes. And we were trying to imagine what it was like to be a laborer doing this journey without a car, without these comforts. And also thinking about what it means now to exist in all this comfort of our capitalist logics as well, too. And all along the way, I kept hearing about these kind of motifs of ghosts, the ghosts and the remnants. So this piece is an homage to that. And it's homage to also the Fraser River, which we travel along, while we also watch the uh, pipeline infrastructure going in. So it was quite a startling contrast. Okay, thank you very much. So we're going to try and make some connections from Janet thinking about labor to Karen Jones' work, which is going to be hard to see, but are those five farm implements on the wall across from me. Um, and Karen Jones is also thinking about labor. She has a practice that thinks about um, race, labor, and conditions of power. Um, and this work is one of the first works that she made after coming out of a jewelry practice. She was a goldsmith. And when you get close to these works, you can see that the farm implements are inlaid with silver and gold damascene. And damascene is uh, a jewelry technique that was used um, in Syria, in Japan, um, often on really valuable items, but also on items of armor. Um, and Karen is a Vancouver-based artist, um, and she moved to Salt Spring to pursue a kind of rural, utopic life, and uh, thought she would do a lot of gardening and canning, and started to realize that those people that were undertaking agriculture on Salt Spring Island tended to be those of a wealthier class, and that that agriculture was more of a um, vocation rather than something that was an economic um, viability. So it wasn't sustainable for her. So ultimately, she jeweled these farm implements as a kind of critique around um, this notion of labor and the kind of aestheticization of labor and a romanticization of the rural. Um, and we're sorry that she couldn't be with us here tonight. Um, and I'm just going to get you to think about another artist before we go around the corner, because um, I don't think that's a good idea. But Alex Morrison is also a Vancouver-based artist who's not with us here tonight. But Alex has a practice who has really thought a lot about um, architecture and design and um, the kind of socialist practices of experimental living, again, from the arts and crafts movement um, through to the 60s um, countercultural moment. And so you'll see three um, drawings by Alex that take up um, uh, a kind of text-based um, play on a Morrisonian ethics around moving to the country, um, homes for the people, but also ideas of beauty and the way that art is part of the everyday. Um, so just think a little bit about labor and the way that aestheticization is like built into labor in that kind of socialist critique when you go around the corner. Um, and then also we're going to talk about another work that we're not going to be able to go look at to set us up for a conversation with Tiziana. So, Caitlin. Okay. Yeah. All right, about Rodney. Okay, so uh, maybe if you're on that side, you'll be able to see down the hall um, and see this kind of incredible uh, arts and crafts style wallpaper that's on the outside um, of this room here where the video is showing. It's uh, Rodney Graham, who's one of Canada's uh, most prominent artists, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. When is the work from? 2006. Uh, it's called City Self, Country Self, and it's a four-minute loop in which Rodney, who often plays the main character in his video installations, plays both the, the city dandy and the country rube. And they sort of follow each other around a beautiful European city. Um, and in a, as Melanie said a few times, this kind of doppelganger effect of the country self and the city self. And I won't spoil, it's not really a spoiler, but when they do meet, they meet in a sort of like very violent way in which the city dandy kicks the rube to the street. And it, it becomes a quite a sort of potent symbol of a sort of idea that we're trying to think through here is this sort of very violent displacement of uh, the way that private property operates. So I'll just leave it there. And where do we go? Is it Tiz? Yeah. The work that I contributed to this exhibition are two paintings and a film work. The paintings kind of were early moments of like thinking about the subject of 
the country mouse and the city mouse fable. And then there's a third element. So my film is called Country Mouse, City Mouse, Hamster. And then the paintings were called Country Mouse, City Mouse, um, The Simple Life. So basically in 2019, I was invited to Grand Prairie uh, to do a residency there by Derek Chang. And um, sort of what I expected to be doing kind of shifted and ended up uh, spending like a week on a homestead by uh, Euphemia McNaught, who was like a local painter there who kind of contributed, she's a kind of a hero, heroine in the region and she was hired to paint the first highways um, to I think the Yukon from Grand Prairie. And um, so I was there, there was like a, I was actually in a trailer, there was no water on the premises and then there was the foundation of Euphemia McNaught's um, studio and so it was the first time I did a residency where someone was like can I respond to this place and I was like uh like it was just very awkward because I was like I don't really have any relationship to this place but it made me think about my settler my own settler um uh, past like I Im immigrated to Canada when I was five my dad when he was 18 my mom was born in Edmonton and her family immigrated to Canada in like the 60s or 70s I don't remember no maybe 50s anyways so I was painting the these paintings for an exhibition with Gita Thiraja called Ozone Gleaners and I decided to title a painting The Simple Life and I wasn't really I, then I googled The Simple Life and then I was reminded of the, ex, the reality TV show from 2003 to 2006 or whatever, The Simple Life, which then um, kind of opened up space to the film, which overlaps the Simple Life narrative, fantasy, reality TV show with the mouse fable. And they kind of act as like avatars for the mouse. So it's a very low, fi, low fidelity film that integrates these things. Oh yeah, and I want to thank also Ella, Sam, who helped with the editing and the music, made most of the soundtrack. And then my mom, who's also starring in the film, is like watching it right now, she is down there. You'll recognize her. Um, and she's seen it for the first time. And what else can I say? There's a lot to say. I guess like with The Simple Life, I was thinking a lot about the construction of fantasy and how like almost like fiction can become reality. So I guess it like leads back to some other conversations about how, or Gabe's work about an idea and that it's an idea, but even like a f story or our own reality is just based on a narrative that is like held on to. And then, um, yeah, I think my relationship to it, I grew up in a really rural context. My parents ran a uh, market garden and so I think moving to the city at a certain age I felt a lot of shame that I didn't even like register until much later until this like cottage core stuff where I was like oh why is this embraced in a certain way where I have like not like acknowledged it so it kind of also was a way to like think about that and yeah the hamster my last thought thing I'll share is like the hamster is like the third element and it kind of represents uh, an idea that you believe is a certain thing. So the hamster is this like hyper domesticated pet or so it looks that way. But then as I research the hamster more, it is actually like uh, a pet that can't really be domesticated. So then it's like captured and contained and it has its wheels so that it can run and exercise or have the sensation of being wild. But um, yeah, and so it represents this kind of third space of the dichotomy that like kind of disrupts that um yeah thank you okay we have two more to go so hold on just bear with me before i hand the mic over to the artists again uh, sorry architects against housing alienation but i didn't want to miss talking about lawrence polio wechtelin's paintings which apartheid canada behind me and you are on indian land um, in front of me and Lawrence Paul is a very senior, important um, painter um, based in Vancouver. He's Coast Salish and Okanagan. And his work is largely painting, sculpture, and drawing, thinking very much about colonial forces, the forces of capitalism. And these literature paintings are not often seen, um, are a series that are, you know, sort of.
talking about the fantasy of Canada, just sort of back to your idea of the fantasy of construction, the construction of ideas. And I think Lawrence is reminding us um, precisely where we stand in the construction of this particular nation. So we really see these works as very important punctuation marks um, throughout the exhibition. Um, and I will pass it over to Matthew and Sarah. Um, as the last person speaking, I'll try to be as brief as possible. So my name's Matthew Souls. Um, I'm part of the group Architects Against Housing Alienation. This is one of my co-collaborators, Sarah Stevens. Um, every two years, the Canada Council um, awards uh, generally a group of architects or architectural thinkers $500,000 to represent the country that is called Canada at the Venice Biennale of Architecture. So in 2021, Sarah and I and four other um, architects and academics uh, named the others, uh, uh, Patrick Stewart, David Fortan, Adrian uh, Blackwell, and Tiana Vujovic, all of us who have a long-standing interest in the problematics of capital and architecture's um, really fraught relationship with it in reproducing and generating um, very uh, problematic power structures in this country. So we, we got together and we said, you know, let's try to, uh, you know, get this $500,000, but let's try to co-opt that money and channel it into the creation of a new organization that would fight for better housing on the ground here in Canada. So our, we, we invented this group called Architects Against Housing Alienation. Um, we chose the word alienation because we believe that the current housing system in Canada needs to be abolished because it generates alienation for all of us in different forms. Some in more extreme acute forms and more in subtle forms. But rich people paradoxically in their big mansions are also alienated in different ways than someone houseless living in a park. Um, we see alienation as alienation from land, alienation from one's home, alienation from one's uh, family and friends, and alienation from oneself. So we were fortunate enough to get this opportunity to represent Canada at the 2023 Venice Biennale. And we generated, um, or, or through lots of on the ground work, meeting with people, building relationships across this country, we uh, a, a kind of amassed a large collective that has uh, uh, 30 different architectural practices, activist organizations, and advocacy groups across the country from Halifax, Montreal, Toronto, the North, uh, the prairies to BC. And we were really excited to bring together groups of people fighting already, doing amazing work to change the housing system and use this $500,000 to give them new momentum and create new relationships because often architects weren't talking to activists, advocates weren't talking to architects, so on and so forth. So um, long story short, we created a campaign called Not For Sale. We occupied the pavilion in Venice as our campaign headquarters, and we literally used it as a working space to generate uh, campaign material, campaign resource strategies and tactics to confront the ongoing crime of the housing system in Canada. So what you will see in here is some of the material of the Not For Sale campaign. And always our plan was to come back to Canada and share this and continue to build it. So we're having events, conversations, film projections, protests across the country in many different forms. So we see this here as part of the campaign. So um, at, the, at the heart of Not For Sale campaign are 10 demands, 10 things that we're demanding uh, for change. You will see them written out and there are associated maps, diagrams, slogans, architectural proposals for what we think can achieve um, this, this necessary and urgent radical transformation of how we do with housing in Canada. Thank you very much. Uh, let's just give a final uh, round of applause for all of the brave artists who have <laughs> spoken with you tonight. <laughs>